Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Today's sermon is over Mark chapter 15, verses 22 through 39, entitled, Were You There When Jesus Was on the Cross? Mark 15, we've been pursuing a um, mini-series here for the past four Sundays, looking at the four different events in the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry. Uh, the week of the Passion, first of all, uh, asking the question all the way through, uh, were you there? And uh, starting with, were you there when he rode into Jerusalem? And then secondly, were you there in the upper room? And then last week, were you there uh, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane? And then this week, fi finishing up, with, were you there uh, when he hung on the cross? Uh, the cross is a central symbol of our faith. Uh, there's a lot of symbols that happen during the, during the Passion Week. You have, of course, palm branches, you know, as a symbol this week. Uh, the wine and the bread, of course, the first Lord's Supper was served on the night Jesus was betrayed. Uh, you have uh, other things uh, that, that, are, that are possible symbols that go on. The, the towel and the bowl, Jesus washes the feet of his disciples there in that same upper room uh, experience. And so you have some great symbols that come out of, out of that for our Christian faith. But uh, there's nothing comes close to the cross. In the sense uh, of a symbol, uh, you see the cross everywhere. We see it on top of our steeples. We see it on our gravestones. We see it bumper stickers on our cars. Um, we see... Um, crosses ever how many of you are wearing a cross right now some sort around your neck on your wrist on your ring on your something i got it i got it on the outside of my bible like you got to have you know it makes it better somehow i don't know it just that's a good bible cover i've had it for many years uh cross is central and there's a reason for it uh but i would say a very very unusual symbol uh when you consider actually what the cross was the cross was an implement of execution it wasn't used for anything else it didn't decorate our homes prior to Christ, that is. Uh, we didn't wear it around our neck, for crying out loud, for sure. Uh, I think um, Max Lucado, I think he put it well when he says, isn't it strange that a tool of execution and torture would become a symbol of hope? Uh, what, what happened to that? What changed it? Uh, to wear a cross around your neck back then would have been, the, would, would, you wear the symbol, would you wear a mini uh, electric chair around your neck? <laughs> that, it would have been that weird for them. Uh, before, before Jesus. The cross was, was a symbol of execution. Like I said, it was a symbol of, of, of torture. Uh, the Romans killed thousands of people on crosses. Uh, would, you, uh, would you print a picture of a firing squad on your business card or your personal card? You'll put a cross on there. Effectively, there's no difference. It was, they, were, they were used to kill people, uh, but there is a difference because of Christ. Uh, would, you, would you hang a bronze-covered hangman's noose on your wall in your living room? But you'll hang a bronze cross on your wall in your living room, right? And I would, I'm not against that. I'm rightfully so. What's happened with the cross, though? Something's happened here because this implement of torture and execution has been changed into something altogether different. It's become the symbol of our faith. Uh, why the cross? Well, because of who died there, bottom line. Because of what was done there for us. And I want us to read what was done there here, uh, Mark's, uh, Mark's position on this. Let's see what, what he says and what he saw and what he experienced and hear his, his uh, part of this story. Verse 22 of Matthew 15, it says, And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which is translated place of skull. It's still there. I was there. Uh, we were just there. And it's still there. It's been defaced some. Uh, the place of the skull, which is part of the, part of the hill uh, that the Temple Mount was built on, and it's the high place of the Temple Mount. It's been defaced because it's in Muslim territory, effectively. It's in Arab territory, and it's, a back, it's the backdrop of a, of a bus station. And so it has been, people climb up on it, and it's been messed, messed with. Of course, they've taken pictures throughout the centuries of it, and you can tell how things have changed. But you can see how very easily they would have called it a place of the skull. It looked just like a skull. It's got two eye sockets, it's got a nose, it's got a mouth. And it's in this rock. It looks, and it's white rock, as a matter of fact. So it looks like a skull very much so. So they take him to this place, and they crucify him out in front of it. And they, they try to give him, it says, wine mixed with myrrh, which, by the way, would have been a sedative. They don't, he doesn't take it, notice, because he's taken the full force of this. Whatever pain's coming to him, he's taken it. And it's his decision. And they crucified him and divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots for them to decide what each would take. And it was the third hour, so nine o'clock in the morning, when they crucified him, and the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. What kind of charge is that? Well, none. But that's what he's crucified for. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. And the scriptures were fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with transgressors. Yeah, they were hung up there together as if he was one of them, but he was not. Those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads, saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross. We said last time, he couldn't save himself and save us. Either or. 
He goes on. Let this Christ, all right, the king, or I'm sorry, verse 31, in the same way the chief priests also, along with the scribes, were mocking him among themselves, saying he saved others, but he cannot save himself. Yeah, exactly right. Let this Christ, the king of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe And those who crucified with him were casting their same insults against him. We saw, saw last time in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, Jesus says, I... Do you not know that I could have called down more than, more than 12 legions of angels? 72,000 is, is, is 12 legions of angels in full force. I'm thinking 72,000 angels could take care of business, right? So he doesn't take care of business because to save himself would mean he couldn't save us. And so that was the whole purpose, to seek and save that which was lost. Not to save himself, he has nothing to prove. He, he can, did not consider equality with God, it says in Philippians, something to be grasped. In other words, he has nothing to prove. He's been the son of God. Forever he's been the son of God. That wasn't the thing he came to prove. There was nothing to prove. There was only something to be done, and that's rescue us. In order to do that, he can't at the same time rescue himself. And so no, he couldn't get, come down from the cross, not and do what he came to do. And he was going to go through with it, like I said, not even taking a sedative to get through it here. So, so no. And it says in that verse 33, when the sixth hour, so now we're about noon, had come, darkness, darkness fell over the whole land until three o'clock, ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, it says, which is Aramaic, for my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And when some of the bystanders heard, they began to say, behold, he's called, they misheard him. He's calling for Elijah, they think. They'd been following Jesus around like a freak show or whatever because he's doing all this stuff. Maybe Elijah's going to come now out of nowhere. Someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine and, or vinegar and, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Let him, let's see if we can keep him alive, basically, and see if, see if this thing will come about, whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered with a loud cry, it says, and breathed his last. And the veil of the temple and on the temple mount was torn in two from top to bottom. Right as that happened, when the centurion who was standing there right in front of him saw the way in which he breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. Cross of Christ. The cross. Why is it special? Why is the cross central? What we see is immediately is that Jesus is crucified, three days later resurrected, and then 40 days later he creates the church through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And immediately the cross of Christ is forefront in what they do. Cross of Christ, the message of the cross, the meaning of the cross, the purpose of the cross, the preaching of the cross. Peter, who prior to this was a guy who didn't open his mouth except to change feet, right? He preaches the first sermon. What is his sermon? The whole theme is about the crucifixion, is it not? Notice, therefore let all the house of Israel know. This is a fisherman, like I said, who just shot his mouth off all the time. And he comes up with this incredible sermon. Let them know for certainty that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified. It's the center, center of all that they did. Both Lord, he says, and Messiah became center of what they believed, center of the church, center of their preaching, center of all their faith and everything. When we proclaim Christ crucified, notice, not Christ's teachings, he taught good stuff. But I'm telling you, his teachings won't save you. They were not intended to. His miracles won't save you. They were not intended to. His virgin birth won't save you. It wasn't intended to. He came and became a man so that he could die. Yes, he taught good stuff. Yes, he set a good example. Shouldn't neglect those things in any way, but you need to understand that was not why he came, not bottom line. Bottom line was to be crucified, it says. We proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, not his life, but his death. Foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God through that crucifixion. That's what he is for us. Galatians 5, Paul says, But I, brethren, if I still preach, sorry, if I still preach religious stuff, why am I still being persecuted? Then the stumbling block, notice, of the cross. That's what it is. Either it becomes a stepping stone or a stumbling block for you. Either it's the, it's the cutoff place, though. It's the dividing line. That's where everything is. People don't have a problem with the, the, the historic Jesus and the stuff that he taught, and, and some not even a problem with his miracles. The problem is his death and resurrection. That's the crux of the matter. That's where everything changes. That's where he ceases to be just a good person and one more religious leader, and he turns into who he claimed to be, who, which is the Son of God and the Savior. He was that all the way, but how did he prove himself? Because he died and he resurrected. That's how we know. Again, the point is the cross, right? 
center of the cross. Again, in Galatians, those who desire to make good showing in your flesh try to compel you to be circumcised simply so that they will not be persecuted for the cross. So it, was, it was the center for the church. It, it's where everything changed for them. And it's, by the way, it's the problem that the world had with them. And it was a contention and a part of the persecution for them. Uh, Ephesians 2. His purpose, that is God's, was to create it himself one new humanity out of two, that is Jews and Gentiles, two groups. Thus making peace, how did he do it? In one body, he reconciled both of them to God through where? The cross. The cross is central, you see. The cross is central, by which, namely the cross, he put to death the enmity. He fixed stuff there. Things were changed there. It was the, the, the beginning and the end of things. Many, it says, live as enemies, notice, of the cross. Not his teachings. Not his miracles. But the cross... What he did on the cross, why is the cross central? Because it is, that's why. It just is, and it became central for the church for all the right reasons. The cross of Christ is central, not because, just because he was hung there, but because of something else that was hung there. See, when Jesus died, he died to pay for our sins. The Romans killed thousands of people on the crosses. And when they hung them there, at least, at least in theory at least, they were there paying for their own sins. I'm not saying there wasn't bad, bad uh, justice back then, no doubt there was. But in most cases, they were hung there for their own crimes. They were hung there for their own sins. But Jesus was hung up there to what? What does it say? What, is, what was the placard over his head? The king of the Jews? It, it says he was born king of the Jews. He doesn't have to die to prove that. Why was he hung there? Because there was something else that was hung there. And I want to talk to you about that. See, what happened in a Roman culture was that when you committed a crime, the way they kept record of the crime is that they would make a placard in your name and have your name on it. it would, below your name would have the crime that you committed, and then below that it would say whatever sentence that you had to pay. How many days, how many hours, how many weeks, how many months, how many years, whatever. That placard would be put over the top of your jail cell if it was not a capital offense. And you would know that's how long this guy's got or this girl's got to pay. And if you lived through that process, which some didn't, then that placard they would take and they would stamp it or write on it effectively paid in full. Your debt to society was this many days or this many months or this many years. And when you had done it, they put paid in full. And that placard became your ticket back into society. Hey, we heard that so-and-so broke the law. And he says, I did, but look. That's why I can own land again. That's why I can get a job. That's why I can live here again. I paid my, my debt, my get-out-of-jail-free card, if you will, and my ticket back into society. Here it is. On the other hand... It, they would take this same placard if your offense was a capital offense, so they were going to execute you. And they would take this, and this is where you're most familiar with this, they would take this placard and they would put it over your head on the cross you were crucified on. So they were going to kill you if you're not a Roman citizen. They would kill you on a cross. They would use it as an example. It was a public execution and it stayed public for years. They usually put crosses on the downwind side of a, of a city because they left you out there to rot. And they would leave the sign above your head and by the way, they would put it on a thoroughfare so that when you walked by, first of all, you would be about eye level with whoever's being crucified. They weren't up on a high hill or something like that. I know that's the picture you got, but it doesn't say that anywhere in the scriptures. And it wasn't a practice of the Romans. They put you on the main road, on the intersection of roads, somewhere downwind, and they would put over the top of your head this same placard they would put on your jail cell, except, of course, the, ex the penalty was not you know, this many days or months. It was obviously uh, capital. And so capital offense, they're going to kill you. You're hung out there. And uh, we're, we're most familiar with this because it tells us right here that the placard put over Jesus' head had, had it on there, right? What was he crucified for? The king of the Jews. So is that what he died for? That's no capital offense, is it? Even Pilate said that, didn't he? I find no reason in this man to put him to death. And they said, nonetheless, what he kept saying, crucify him. Crucify him. The cross was central. Nonetheless, even though in their rebellion, they still did exactly what the Bible said that they would do, predicted 600 years before in Psalm 22, that they would crucify him. And so it wasn't, though, for the reason of that placard, his own placard, that he was crucified. It was another placard that was there. Did you, have you ever seen it? It's in the Scriptures. It wasn't visible to anyone walking by that day because it was something that, that truly was a contract between the Son and the Father. There was another placard up there, and guess what placard it was? It was yours. And it was mine. Colossians speaks of it very clearly. Notice chapter 2. He made... You alive, God did, together with Jesus, with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled the certificate of death, 
There's your placard and mine. Consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, he has taken it out of the way, having what? Nailed it to the cross. I don't remember reading that anywhere else, but it is right there. Whose placard was that? He was the king of the Jews. It wasn't his placard. It was your placard. It was yours, the stuff that was against you, right? The things that were going to con condemn you, the decrees against you and me. That's the stuff that's other. I want to talk about that placard for just a second. I want you to think about that placard. What would be written on yours? God of the universe, you committed crimes against him. You've broken his eternal laws. What would be hung over your head? Can I help you? How about liar? How about cheat? Possibly thief, murderer, adulterer. How about, you name it, idolater, God hater. What would be over your head? You've earned it. Maybe we should just put the whole Ten Commandments up there and say these are the top ten reasons why she's got to go. It'd be true, wouldn't it? It'd be true for me. It would certainly be true for us. These these are the reasons, and that is why he hung there. See, it's not just that he hung there. He had no reason to hang there outside of the placard, this placard that was hung above him. Your sins and my sins, this was the issue. He'd been forever eternal, co-eternal with the Father, no reason to die, no need to die, no possibility of dying. The whole purpose of him dying was to pay for this. It's that placard, that one. That's the reason. Why is the cross central? Because of that, you see. Psychologists have, interestingly, every time they come up with a, with a true evaluation, they agree with what the scriptures They've found very interesting that people have a very deep sense within us, no matter what culture we're from, no matter how backwards or how far away from moral teachings we possibly get, we all have a deep sense within us, something primordial about us, that is, we have a, we have a need to see things set right. We have a need to see uh, crimes that are committed that the person be caught and that they pay for their crimes. or sins that are committed, that person be caught and pay for their sins. And they say, it's very interesting, you can't get past it. No matter how messed up a person's thinking is, they all have that within them. And they say they're very interesting, easily demonstrated if you just simply look at the way we do movies or books. We, we read these books and we watch these movies or we watch these stories because uh, you'll have a villain, right? What happens to the villain at the end of all those movies and books? They get theirs, right? And if they don't, guess what? We don't watch them. We really don't. That does not sell. And they said it just simply doesn't. If you'll just simply watch the pattern, we, we know how it's going to end because there's something in us that says it has to end that way. And if you try to end it any other way, people don't buy that book. They don't go see that movie. They, it won't be popular. Because they said there is... There is something in us. Here's the quote from the psychologist. They said, we are deeply satisfied by the punishment of an offender. We understand it. It makes sense. Why is the cross significant? Why is it central? Because we understand sins have to be paid for. They have to be paid for. God built us that way. We understand it. The cross is central because that is the place where our sins were paid for. Here's a question posed, posed by some, and it's, it's, well, it needs to be dealt with. Why, why can't God just forgive our debt? Why can't God just say, you know what, live and let live. God's wealthy in righteousness. He'll just give us righteousness, and he can just cancel out. You know, no reason to pay. I just forgive you. Move on. Why can't God just arbitrarily do it since he's God? I mean, isn't he God? Then why can't he just say, okay, there's no more sin. It's over with. Well, to think that way, by the way, is an error because it demonstrates, first of all, an ignorance, maybe most importantly, an ignorance of how debt actually works. You know how debt actually works? We're less and less understanding that in our society since it seems from top down we don't get the whole issue of debt. Let me, let me explain how debt works. So as soon as the church service is over, by the way, I'm going to beat you to the restaurant. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to get my car and I'm going to be wheeling out of this parking lot. But let's say, for instance, I hit your car. And I don't know when the last time you wrecked your car, but like the, the minimal damage you can have on a car is like a thousand bucks. I mean, even the slightest thing, it's like, okay, a thousand, whatever above a thousand is what you're going to be paying. So I run into your car and you come out and you say, you know what, that was a really good sermon preacher. So I tell you what, this time I'm going to forgive what you did. 
just setting you, I'm just preparing you for that possibility someday. It's always going to be a good sermon, so you always have a reason to cancel the debt. I, I, forgive, I forgive you for this. It's forgiven. Don't worry about it, Pastor. It's forgiven. So let's say you're that awesome and you're that generous so that you forgive me. And I try to pay. You say, no, 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 I'm going to take care of it. So, so what happens is, is when you say, I forgive you, does money just like automatically fall from the sky? You know, because you did the, you did the right thing. He preached a good sermon, and so you're going to forgive him because, you, you know, you want to feel. It's Sunday, for crying out loud. It's Easter. And so you're going to do the right Christian thing and just say, I forgive you. And so money falls out of the sky. Or boom, I don't know, some magic takes place and the dent comes out of your car and all the problems are taken care of and no money. Could, because I, don't, I didn't pay it and because you were so, like I said, so kind and generous to forgive me, that money just, it just fixes itself. Is that what happens? No, who's, since I'm not paying for it, who gets to pay for it? You do. Because it doesn't fix itself. Once it's done, it doesn't automatically undo Someone's got to pay your insurance or whatever, but you paid for that insurance, right? So let me give another example. Our, our, our island here is, uh, a lot of our industry is uh, property, and I would recommend to you, based upon some realtors that I'm sitting in this audience right now, they would love to sell you stuff. And we got great stuff here. But uh, we took a big hit back in 2007. Everybody did. Uh, the housing market just went in the slumps because of... Uh, because of shoddy banking practices and fat cat executives and corporate corruption, and they threw the whole wrench into the whole economy, and it was, but it was based upon real estate. And our real estate here, this is second, second home market, and our second home market hasn't recovered. Well, I don't know wherever you're from, houses are back up to being worth of what they used to be. They're just not here. It's a good time to buy, by the way. I'm just giving you a secret. Because, because of what happened, because the banks were giving 100% loan to value, you come in with a $300,000 home, I'd give you a $300,000 loan. Who wouldn't get a loan like that? 3% interest or something like that. They were doing that wholesale, literally. And so when everything crashed in 2007, 2008, you had banks, for instance, like Bank of America, which is upside down in their loans by $17 billion with a B. They weren't the only ones, Chase Bank and all these other big banks. And our government, our federal government at that time, came forward and says these banks, quote, are too big to fail. And so they forgave them the debt, kind of like you, me hitting your car and you forgiving me for the dent, they forgave the debt. And it was in the billions and billions of dollars. And so, so of course, when they did the right thing, which was to bail out these banks because they were too big to fall, money just fell from heaven. <laughs> and it took care of all this, Right? And they did, we didn't get any here, by the way, but it just fell from heaven. And, and right? No. So when government says, we forgive you the debt, what are they saying? We're going to pay for the $17 billion or the $100 billion or whatever it was that these banks had, uh, uh, were upside down in. And where'd they get their money from? Oh. So you weren't mad, but now you are. <laughs> they don't have money except that which we give them, Right. So we're the government of the United States here. We're the funders of the government of the United States. And so that's the way debt works. Debt isn't I forgive you and money falls out of heaven. Debt is I forgive you and I have to pay for it, you see. That's the way debt works. That's the way it works. That's exactly the way it was working on the cross. God was literally eating the debt of our sin. It, that's the way it works. God couldn't just arbitrarily say, you know what? I didn't mean it, those Ten Commandments. I was just mad that day. <laughs> no, he says, the debt has to be paid, and it's going to be paid for by my son. He paid for our sin on the cross. God was justly forgiving the debt by personally covering the cross. Why is the cross central? Because of what happened there. Because what happened for us there. The cross is central because of the price of our sin was paid on the cross. And then finally, the cross is central because it reveals that there is no limit to the forgiveness and the love of God. There's no limit to God's ability to forgive, his desire and ability to forgive, and his desire, excuse me, to love us and forgive us. I don't know if you've ever seen this verse before, but if you haven't, you need to memorize. Take a picture with your phone. John 3, 16, for God so Loved the rich, the Republicans, the thin, the sober. Doesn't say that. 
God so loved the young, the old, the, what does it say? The everybody. God so loved everybody that he gave his only begotten son. And here's another important, that, that so loved the whole world and the whoever or the whosoever. Or for us, the, the most, some of the most important words in this whole passage. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have ever. So God loves everybody so that anybody who comes to him, it doesn't matter what you've done, it doesn't matter your background, thin, false, over, uh, drunk, whatever, come to him. Come to him. God will forgive you. God, God accepts you. Uh, it, it, he died for us all. He loves us all. Uh, universities exclude you, don't you know, young people? If you're not smart enough, or if you're, or if you're not a Hollywood star with a lot of money, apparently. <laughs> Businesses exclude you if you're not qualified, don't they? God, listen, is trying to find every way to include you. Everyone and anyone who comes to him, the scripture teaches, God loves you. God accepts you. You have to come to him through his means, though. For whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting, believes in who? God's only begotten. So everyone he loves and anyone who comes to him, but it's through one slot, right? The son. Single son. The single thing that he did for us. It wasn't his good teachings that saved you. It wasn't his miracles that offer us everlasting life. It was his death on a cross. Why is the cross central? Because it's everything for us. It's everything. It's the place where God will meet you. It's the place where you meet God. Because it's the place where he gives forgiveness away for free. Paying for it himself. All your debts. I want to ask you please to close your eyes and bow your heads with me. And I want us to think about the things that we've learned today. The cross of Christ. Why is it central? Because it is. Because it is. Because of who was hung there. Because of what else was hung there, our, our sins, because of the sins, death that was paid there for who? For whoever, for the whole world that he loved and for whoever would turn to him and accept that forgiveness that he offers you. The cross of Christ. Have you dealt with the cross of Christ? I'm not asking you if you're a religious person. I'm not asking you if you believe in God, I'm assuming those things are true since you're here in church on Easter Sunday. But I'm asking with you, have you dealt with what, what Easter, what, what it's really about? That God is offering us eternal life and that this life is in his Son and that whoever has the Son, it says, has the life. And whoever does not have the Son of God does not have the life. Have you had a personal encounter Jesus is the Savior, but have you had a personal encounter with him, acknowledging him and accepting him as your Savior? The Bible says that's got to happen for you. All God's intent for you, for the whole world, all God's acceptance for whoever comes to him, comes back to you saying, would you have him? He's not going to go past your choice. He's not going to go past. He's not going to override, even though he's capable of it. He's not going to override your will. Will you trust him today? Maybe, maybe, maybe a simple prayer in your heart to him, something like this, saying, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior. I, I trust you. I trust what you did. I trust the price that you paid, the debt that was eaten there on the cross that you took for me. I trust it. I accept what you did as my salvation. No magic in words. The work comes through a heart that believes and the power of God who works. Will you trust him today? God, I thank you that you have done all these things, spanning heaven and earth, spreading out your arms on a cross to show us how great your love is, how deep your desire, not even taking a mild sedative to overcome the pain of what was coming for us. You took it all for us, every last drop, every last issue, every last problem. And you hung it on the cross, and you paid for it. It's gone. And for all those who believe, it's gone. Thank you, Lord, for being that for us. Thank you that you're the sinner. Why is the cross special? Because of not itself, but because of what you did and what you are. We put our faith in you today. We trust you today. We trust what you did on the cross. We praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptist.org.